Blair of the Mounties, a story of the Royal Northwest Mounted Police. We present the 11th episode in the dramatic series, Blair of the Mounties, being the second part of the Cherry Hill mystery. Our story finds Inspector Blair on long leave in England. Through his relationship with Colonel Markham, Chief of the County Police, Blair is called in to assist in the solution of a strange murder mystery. Two men in succession have met their death by a strange weapon, which puzzles the local police. As our story opens, we find Blair, Colonel Markham, and Superintendent Coulter discussing the problem. You ain't a kidding, are you, Inspector? No, I wouldn't do that, Coulter. But I believe I have the answer to this riddle. And if I'm right, it's a very simple answer. Simple? <laughs> I don't see how it could be simple, Jimmy. Let's look at the facts. Two men have been killed. First, old Dr. Slade, who seemed to have been killed by a rifle bullet, fired by young Arthur Slade. Seemed to have been killed by a bullet? I tell you, there's no doubt about but it. There is a doubt about it. The experts in London don't think that was an ordinary bullet wound. I don't care what they think. We found the bullet. It had been through the man's body. It fitted the rifle that young Slade was holding when Jarvis found him. They can't get away from that. I wouldn't be too sure. Hmm. Well, of course, if the firearms experts raise an objection and get young Slade off on a technicality, I shall be only too pleased. He's a decent sort, and as long as it doesn't affect our reputation in the county police, there's no harm done. But it will affect your reputation, and Coulter's especially, as I think you'll see if you'll just let me finish stating these facts. All right, carry on then. You arrest young Slade for murder. He's tried, convicted, and sentenced to hang next week. Then the Home Secretary's office digs into the evidence. They get the big experts on the job. The experts say the hole through Dr. Slade's body was not made by a bullet fired from a rifle. But that's silly. We found the bullet. The markings on it showed that it had been fired from young Slade's rifle. The servants heard the shot. They found young Slade with the rifle in his hand. It had just been fired. Nobody on earth can upset that case. I think they can. Well, of course, I'll admit there's one other possibility. This man Jarvis, who was in the next room to young Slade, might have done it. That's what young Slade claimed himself. But Jarvis had an alibi. I believe Jarvis did fire that shot. I believe he was in the plot to pin the crime on young Slade. But I don't think that shot killed Dr. Slade. Oh, bless me so. You mean there was two men in it? Yes, I believe they were trying to remove both young Slade and his father. There's a big fortune there, remember. And you believe this theory they have in London, that Dr. Slade was killed by some other weapon than a rifle? I certainly do. Against all the proved evidence we have? Yes. That's ridiculous. I don't know, sir. Head of the way Inspector Blair found that Hamilton murderer, I'm a-putting me money on him, I am. <laughs> well, that's funny. On that Hamilton case, you were dead against Blair. Now you're all for him. Of course I am. I got a lot of faith in Inspector Blair. Well, I still don't see how they can upset our case. What about that second murder? It happened at Cherry Hill, too. The young policeman, Burridge, had the same kind of wound as was found in Dr. Slade's body. Only it didn't go right through. Just went into the heart. And there was no bullet in the body. Yes, that is rather puzzling. But if you prove that Dr. Slade was not killed by a shot fired from a rifle, that lets Jarvis out. I don't know about that, Marco, but it lets young Slade out, and that's all to the good. Yes, that's true. But what we're dealing with is this special inquiry. When the Scotland Yard people start, they move fast. They're sending Kerrigan down by the noon train. I don't want him to steal the show... I tell you, Colonel Marcus, sir, that's just what he'll do if he gets half a chance. I know it's Barney Kerrigan. Oh, well, let's start from something. I'm interested in this man Jarvis. If he really fired that shot, it could only be to fix the murder on an innocent person, this boy Slade, who is heir to the Slade fortune. But what about that there bullet? Oh, just forget the bullet for a minute. Isn't it possible that both these men could have been killed by some silent missile or weapon driven with tremendous force? But what is this mysterious... Never weapon? mind for the present. Let's invent something to fit the facts. Imagine a steel shaft or dart pointed at one end and perfectly smooth. Let us say it's about a foot in length. Well, that's a weird idea, but go on. Well, take the first case of Dr. Slade's death. If such a projectile was driven clear through his body, the murderer could easily conceal it, couldn't Theoretically, he? that's true. Right, then take the second case. The murder of Joe Burry. The thing went in about seven inches. The murderer could pull it out, couldn't he? How do you explain the bullet they found near Slade's body? Hmm, still harping on that bullet. All right, who found it? It was that old Professor Craig. Well, he was the first to get to the body, but he's as harmless an old bloke, and, and, and he's nearsighted, and he's a friend of the murdered man. And he's nearsighted yeah. as an old blooming bat. Now, rather funny that a bullet from a high-powered rifle fired at short range 
We'd be just lying round, isn't it? Yes, but it might happen. Who is Professor Craig, anyhow? He's a retired professor. Lives next door to Cherry Hill. Writes books and runs a lot of charities. Uh, uh, very wealthy, they say. What sort of books does he write? History, mostly. You must have heard of him. James Willington Craig. Oh, yes. I've read one or two of his books. Hmm. Quite a famous man. Look here, Jimmy. We're getting off the track. If you really think there's a chance to turn up something, before Kerrigan gets down, we'd better be moving. Yes. Here we are, Inspector. That's Cherry Hill. And this is the gate that leads to Professor Craig's house. Yes, I see. Let's take a look around. Hello, who's this? Shh. It's the old professor. Out for a walk, apparently. All right. You better have a talk to him. Ah. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon, Professor. Uh, what is this? A conference of the forces of the law? Uh, something like that. We were just taking a look around. Uh, nothing you can tell us, I suppose, Professor. I fear not, Coulter. My first information came from the servants this morning. Uh, shake hands with Inspector Blair here. Uh, he's going to give us a hand with this here case. Ah, good afternoon, Inspector. I've heard of your work. Very happy to meet you. Quite uh, refreshing to find a man of intelligence in the police service. Oh, I mean, that was a nasty one, I must say. Uh, perhaps, Professor Craig, uh, you'd permit me to ask you a few questions. Mm, certainly, certainly, my dear sir. Good, then I'll walk along with you. You'll excuse us, Marco? Of course, go ahead. Coulter and I will have a look at the place where they found poor Burridge. It's just a few yards uh, from the French, uh, here, sir. All right, see you later. Yes, you have a beautiful place here, Professor. Beautiful indeed, sir. And yet a great deal of the charm has gone since the death of my dear friend, Dr. Slade. Yes, I understand you are an intimate friend of Dr. Slade. Yes, yes. That is so. Also that you and he were interested together in certain charitable movements. Mm, that is correct. Recently my life has been devoted largely to the help of my less fortunate brethren. My friend Slade became interested in the work some years ago. Yes, very fine ideal, Professor. I feel so, yes, I feel so. Being myself a man of means, I have thought it my duty to do something for others. I was just wondering, Professor... Aren't you the Professor Craig who wrote the book on ancient armor and weapons? Yes, yes, that was my book. Very fascinating study, Inspector. Yes, I enjoyed the book immensely. Perhaps, uh, Professor Craig, you can explain a technical point for me. Uh, with pleasure. That is, if I am able to. I was just thinking over a little problem in archery. Uh, uh, art archery, did you say? Yes. I understand that the old-fashioned crossbow... While not equal to the ordinary longbow at distant targets, is very deadly at short range. Short range? Yes, uh, uh, that is quite correct. And I believe that up to a distance of, say, 50 yards, the steel bolt, or uh, quarrel, I believe it is called, flies absolutely straight. Up to 50 yards? Uh, uh, yes, yes. Perhaps a little more. Yes. I was thinking, sir, of these two recent murders. Now, um... Put yourself in the position of the murderer. Hey? Purely in theory, of course, uh, Professor. Wouldn't a crossbow be a very efficient weapon for such a purpose? Particularly in the hands of one who was a recognized expert with ancient weapons? Ah, yes, yes. I begin to see your theory, Inspector. It is hard for me to imagine myself in the position of a murderer. You see, being extremely short-sighted would prevent a man like myself from using a crossbow. But if it could be proved that this short-sightedness was merely assumed, Professor... Uh, Inspector Blair, you are either a very brave man or a very foolish one. Well, perhaps a little of both. Don't move, Professor. I'm holding a very serviceable little automatic pistol in my right pocket. Come now, Professor. You and I are men who appreciate refinement. It would be distressing to have to kill a man of your attainments. Ah, uh, quite so. Rather annoying that you should stumble into our little picture. And yet, uh, quite an artistic touch. I should have been prepared. Uh, perhaps I grow old. You'll permit me to smoke a cigarette. Certainly. Uh, but be careful, Professor. Thanks. Would you care to join me? No, thanks. Here, here, drop that! Here! Hello, Marco! Coulter! Hurry up! Come on, this way! Too late, my dear Inspector. I, too, carry a little safeguard. Huh. A very effective poison. 
I have rather less than a minute. Hurry up, Colton. Why? What? Why, blimey? What's wrong, Inspector? Uh, right here. Hurry up. Goodbye, Inspector. Such a pleasure to... to... meet you. <coughs> Why, what's wrong? Is the, is the Professor right? Oh, he's gone, I'm afraid. No. Gone? What do you mean? Hurry, Coulter, doctor. Oh, it's no use. I sprang him on those two murders. He had a little capsule of poison in his cigarette case. Cyanide, I think. Uh, what do you mean? My inspector, you don't mean as this ear old bloke pulled off him murdered? Yes, he's a man, Coulter. But how did he do it? Well, it seems he used the crossbow, a very deadly and silent weapon. A crossbow? Yes, fires a short steel bolt like a pencil. Quite a novel idea. Strike me pink, that's right. Why, there's one of them things on the stand of old armor in the professor's house. But that was rather dangerous, Jimmy, to spring it on him like that. Why didn't you wait? Had to take a chance, Marco. There's a taxi coming up the road. Looks like a Scotland Yard man. Yeah. Not much time left. <laughs> it came out all right. But how did you tumble to the crossbow? Why, it had to be something like that. Ever read Craig's history of ancient weapons? Yes, but... Uh... Well, this is your man. And it looks as if that's Kerrigan coming now. All right, I'll leave you to it. Here, hold on, Inspector. No, I'm going to duck. This is your show. Go ahead, Colter. Tell him the tale. Colonel Markham, sir? Uh, yes, that's my name. Good morning, sir. Hello, Colter. Good morning, Barney. This is Inspector Kerrigan, CID, sir. What can I do for you, Kerrigan? I have instructions to take over the uh, inquiry on the Slade murder. Hello, what's this? Somebody hurt? It's all right, Barney, old sport. That's the murderer. What? Sure, the case is all over. He's the bloke that did it, just committed suicide. And I got all the evidence. Well, well, congratulations. Uh, uh, by the way, we picked up this man Jarvis at Folkestone. It seems that he and Professor Gregg were working a bogus charity racket. In the event of Slade's son dying, all the Slade fortune went to Craig's charities. But I suppose you know all that. <laughs> of course we do. Them's only the blooming details. Main thing is to get the murderer. Well, really, Coulter, beats me how you did it. Oh, that's easy. Uh, ever do any fly fishing? Fly fishing? Why, yes, but uh, I don't see. No, uh, you wouldn't understand. It, it drop in some time, and uh, I'll give you a few pointers. You have heard the 11th chapter in the dramatic series, Blair of the Mounties. Our next episode is entitled, The Train Wreckers, a story of the troop movement in Canada at the outbreak of the World War. <laughs>